Hi, I'm Deb Kimmett, and this is the news brief for October 2020. There's a lot to discuss tonight, and I'm even leaving a bunch of stuff out, but I apologize in advance for the length. Uh, instead of our usual 10 minutes or so, we're looking at around 18 to 20, so let's get started. A shout out goes to the Massage Health Practitioners and COVID-19 Facebook group for calling some of this to my attention. I also belong to various lists that provide uh, overviews of research that's out there as well. I put a partial list in the PDF that I'll post uh, in the chat at the end of the news brief and uh, with the video when it's posted too. Also in the PDF will be the takeaway for massage therapists for each topic discussed. In this news brief, I cover the research that's caught my eye over the last month, as well as questions that came up during the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic check-ins, and questions that have been emailed to me. You'll notice at the bottom of the slides uh, as we go along that I have an abbreviated source. Uh, I mainly wanted you to see the date uh, and the author because I try to bring the most current research in, and the full citation is in the companion PDF file that I'll post. The first topic, humidity and COVID-19, was brought up at the last pandemic check-in, and I'm bringing it up, uh, uh, bringing back uh, the research that I found on the topic. There's a lot about humidity's effect on the flu and other viruses, and then there's one out there that summarized the studies on the coronavirus's response to humidity. Uh, first, we'll have to understand that we're talking about relative humidity and not absolute humidity. We don't really need to get into the difference, but the important thing to remember is that the relative humidity is what's talked about in weather reports and is reported as a percentage. Um, it basically represents the amount of water vapor in the air. The article by Alouette looked at several studies and found that the virus survives better in dry air, which is low relative humidity environments. Because in dry air, the do droplets get smaller which uh, those stay suspended longer because aerosols stay suspended longer. So what they do is they recommend that in buildings, relative humidity be set to 40 to 60%. However, if you get too humid, that can lead to increased mold growth. So 40 to 60% is best. Plus in a hot climate, extreme, co extreme cooling, like uh, when you turn on an air conditioner on high, uh, that should be avoided. Another article suggested that a cheap way to determine the humidity in your office is to spend about $10 for what's called a hygrometer. Now related to humidity, there was some recent research about air temperature in the coronavirus. This study showed that the virus lasts longer in rooms that are uh, cool, about 68 degrees or less. And the hotter the room, the more the virus degrades. So the takeaway for massage therapists, what I take from putting together the info on relative humidity and temperature is that a dry, cool room is ripe for the, ripe for the spread of COVID. A room that's above 68 and at 40 to 60% humidity is good. But if the room gets too hot and muggy, that's not good as mold can form. Now, a note on Riddell's temperature study. Uh, there, that's the bottom, I just added that to the page. The popular press reported that study as the virus lasts 28 days, and this is sensationalistic. I always recommend being a skeptic on articles uh, in the popular press, and I recommend that reading the study is important to do first to see if the press accurately reflects the findings of the study. And then also search for criticisms on studies. Uh, putting the title of the article in your search uh, browser plus the word criticism or critics or problems, those all usually bring up any kind of critique if there is one out there. In the case of Riddell's study, we find out that the researchers used very controlled conditions such as using an artificial medium that does not represent the virus fighting properties of mucus. So it's unlikely that the virus would last that long, that whole 28 days in real conditions. The second issue is that the virus lasted 28 days only on non-porous surfaces, not all surfaces, and only at 68 degrees and only in the dark. So the length of the viability changed when the temperature was changed and when the type of surface was changed as well as not having any sunlight there. So the headline was really sensationalistic. But despite that, what we can glean from all this is that a higher relative humidity is better, but not too high. We know we need to clean, just be thorough, 
and not succumb to these types of sensationalistic headlines. The last study about how long COVID lasts on surfaces leads into the next topic. Uh, this, this last week, I received an email asking, what's the latest on scientific evidence for someone getting COVID from a surface? The studies we just went through talk about what can influence how long the virus can stay viable on a surface before it degrades. But what they don't tell us is whether we can catch it from that surface. So it's not helpful to get excited about how long the virus can last on a surface. There are other factors involved, uh, like humidity, temperature, that type of surface, and so on, and I'll go through some other factors in a minute. But Goldman found that these studies that determine how long a virus can last on a surface tend to use much higher concentrations of the virus than would normally be found in realistic uh, situation which may also mean that the virus doesn't stay as vi viable on a surface as reported in the study because the experiments don't replicate real life. The one study that he found that did a, use a realistic concentration of the virus material found no viable virus on surfaces. But on the flip side, the authors of one article noted that other studies or brought up other studies that did show spread via touching a elevator button, button or, um, or co contaminated or touching contaminated medical equipment. So how do we sort through this conflicting information? Well, to get at the question about COVID from surfaces, the CDC and the articles that I found uh, said that catching the virus through contact with contaminated surface is less common than the other ways uh, that it's spread, like through co close contact and airborne transmission. And here's why. In order for the virus to be spread by touching a surface, there has to be a confluence of events. For example, you have to have a large enough volume of the virus that has to be deposited on that surface, and it would have to remain viable on that surface long enough for you to be able to come in contact with it. And your hands would have to pick up enough of the virus to be infectious, and then you'd have to touch your face, your, your nose, your eyes, or your mouth. So all those things have to happen in order for you to catch it. So so what does this mean? Well, all of the articles I found that said catching the virus from a surface is very unlikely, but not impossible. And one author determined that if you regularly keep things clean and disinfected using standard protocols, well, that makes transmission even more unlikely. So wipe down those surfaces and keep up the cleaning and disinfection protocols. Last month, we also talked about masks providing immunity, but before I get into the research on that, I want to talk about reinfection first because it's related to immunity and it's something that's been in the news lately. So here's the upshot about reinfection. There have been few cases of reinfection, about two dozen as of October 6th. It doesn't seem like much, but the only way to tell if someone has been reinfected is to do a genome study. But not everybody gets a genome study which means that the experts believe that there are a whole lot of cases that have been missed out there about this. So it may not be as rare as thought to be, a reinfection may not be as rare as thought to be. So the fact that reinfection is occurring though raises a whole bunch of questions around how long immunity lasts, whether the immune system is actually damaged by the virus, whether reinfected people are contagious, and whether reinfection can be worse than the first infection. And there's evidence going both ways on that last one. We have evidence that it can hit harder on the second go around or that reinfection can be less severe. We just don't know and we don't know why that is. So how does that affect us? Well, reinfection is possible. And according to Julie Tudor over at the Massage Health Practitioners and COVID-19 Facebook page, the major implication for us is that our infection control measures are gonna be needed on an ongoing basis from here on out. And this means that we need to stay on top of and get good at our disinfecting protocols because we're going to need them. On to masks and immunity. Now back to that topic from last month. The first place that this idea showed up was in an opinion piece in uh, July. It reappeared in another medical journal in September with the main author, but different co-authors. Note that this is not research. It's a paper based on stringing together ideas 
to come up with a plausible hypothesis. And even the authors are careful to say that this needs to be researched. So there's a caveat here. There's no real science on this, but that doesn't mean that there couldn't be science that proves this to be true later. But for right now, to get geeky about it, we do use the word hypothesis because in math and science, the word theory is something that's proven or shown to be true, and this isn't. So it's not a theory, it's a hypothesis at, hypothesis at this point in time. So their hypothesis is that mask wearing can reduce the severity of the disease in those who get infected and possibly increase the number of asymptomatic carriers. So that leaves us with the short answer right there, that no, you don't get immunity, you still get infected, you just may get an asymptomatic case or have a less severe case and then you'll be immune. So once again, the popular press has misconstrued that meaning of the study. So that's what the authors say. But I'm adding a maybe because we just don't, any, don't know any of this for sure. There hasn't been any studies on this, any real papers published on it, just this hypothesis. And I think that there's some things here that the authors have gotten wrong too. Okay, so let's take a look. The authors do have some evidence on their side because the amount of viral load determines the severity of the disease and masks appear to reduce viral load. Plus, in areas where there's more universal mask wearing, there's a lower rate of infected people and a higher percentage of asymptomatic carriers. So far, so good, right? But here's where they seem to go off the rails a little bit. They also make the claim, based on the original science around smallpox, that if a person gets inoculated with a smaller viral load, that can lead to immunity. They talk about it like an inoculation, that you get exposed just a little bit, which can provide you with immunity. First of all, we don't know if you can get immunity in such a way with the coronavirus. Other viruses, yes, but not this one. And yes, there are more asymptomatic carriers in places where people wear masks, but they're getting the virus, okay? They're just asymptomatic. But we just really don't know why some are asymptomatic and why some and others aren't. So secondly, we do know that wearing masks reduces the severity of the case. You can still get COVID, just maybe not as severe of a case. And the next thing to keep in mind is this issue of immunity. The authors of the article claim that reinfection may be rare, implying that once you get it, you're immune. And as we've already discussed, this is why I wanted to discuss it first, is that getting it and then you're immune is not necessarily true. So to answer the question, at this time, wearing a mask doesn't provide immunity. And at best, you may get an asymptomatic case, but you're still infected. But wearing a mask may reduce the severity of the disease when or if you get it, or not. And as we mentioned earlier, reinfection within a few months is possible. And in addition, getting the disease and recovering will not absolve you from wearing a mask because you could get it again. So you still need to wear one because if you get it again, we don't know for sure if, you're, if you'll have a more severe case or not. Last month, we talked about how the CDC put up, then took down information about airborne transmission. That issue has now been resolved. The CDC finally acknowledged that the virus that causes COVID-19 can spread by airborne transmission, not just the big droplets, but by the small aerosols too. What's interesting about this is that they say that airborne transmission can infect people from more than six feet away. That's why it's important to wear a mask and social distance. From my perspective on this and what they say is that it means that you have to have a mask and social distance, not a mask or social distance. It is not one or the other, it's both. The CDC also says that uh, the virus can infect someone after a person has left the space. This means that your next client could be infected by your previous client. And they also mention that enclosed spaces or poor ventilation can also be a factor. And they acknowledge that the most common spread during close, is during close contact by droplets spread through coughing, sneezing, singing, talking, or even breathing. Note that last one, breathing, just breathing can do it. So the implications of all this for massage therapy practice, 
Breathing is a factor. That's why the therapist must wear a properly fitted N95 equivalent or better mask to protect yourself and your client. And that also means not wearing one with a valve. A good HEPA purifier is a must and uh, check your building's ventilation. If you remember from last month, I talked about how COVID-19 was spread from room to room by way of a ventilation system that recirculated air. Um, in short, fresh air is a must also. And as we said, we want to have furnace filters that are at MERV 13 or higher. MERV is the standard way to measure air filtration, but uh, other manufacturers like 3M, the 3M Filtrate Furnace Filters, they use a different scale. And uh, for that scale, I'd go 1900 or higher. We also have to make sure that we use cellar infection protocols uh, infection control protocols. Here are just a few that I want to talk about. So for example, right after that client leaves, keep the mask on. Don't take the mask off. So keep the mask on because the virus is still in the air. Clean and disinfect, purify the air, uh, then take the mask off. And then only after, after the air is purified, then put on your new sheets. And when you're changing sheets or stuffing them in the washer, that can push the virus up into the air too. So wear a mask and fold the sheets over when taking them off the table. And when putting them in the laundry basket or the washer, try to keep them from wrestling or shaking the sheets and also wipe down your laundry area. So that's what we can take away from that. The next item, for clients who are concerned that they are not getting enough oxygen or are afraid that they're going to get carbon dioxide poisoning when wearing a mask, a new study examined whether using a mask led to hypoxia or rebreathing carbon dioxide. So what they did was they compared healthy people to those with severe COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And these are people who already have difficulty breathing. Everyone wore a surgical mask during a six minute walk test. The results from that is that uh, a surgical mask doesn't significantly affect gas exchange, which means not getting enough oxygen or the possibility of carbon dioxide poisoning. So those things are off the table. So what's going on when people think that they can't breathe? Well, the authors posit that psychological factors such as anxiety or claustrophobia may play a role. Or when they're breathing in and out through the mask that that warms the air and the air is flowing around the mask potentially and up around the eyes and so on, is that that increased warmth uh, of the air inhaled can lead to discomfort. So, but none of these are safety concerns. And we know that mask wearing works to curb the spread of the virus. So here's the takeaway. Be sensitive to psychological and discomfort reasons why people don't wanna wear a mask. But this study does provide you with the backup for enforcing a mask policy. They're not gonna get carbon dioxide poisoning. They're not gonna uh, pass out from hypoxia or lack of oxygen. Uh, people can get that adequate oxygen when wearing a mask. They won't get the CO2 poisoning. So you have every right to enforce a mask policy. There are also several other stories that I'm following and watching to see if more data comes out over the next month. For example, on the long haulers front, we're still learning more as time goes by. Several articles have just come out and I'll sort through them through the November meeting. Another story suggests that the virus may have an analgesic effect and is offered as a reason why asymptomatic carriers don't feel the pain from infection. But again, this is all preliminary and I'm just following it for right now. So, so don't go, go by that, uh, that that's, that's truth yet. Um, it's just another potential hypothesis out there. Uh, there's more research on COVID and the severity of COVID and blood type is also coming out. We've talked about this before where people with type A blood type may be more likely to have a more severe case than other blood types. Again, I'll have more on that for the November meeting. And finally, herd immunity. There's a move afoot to attempt herd immunity in the United States. A group of folks got together in a town called Great Barrington and decided to put forward this plan. The concept behind it is that you protect the elderly and the vulnerable and then you open up for everyone else. On the surface, this sounds really good, but 
to be real honest, the uh, vast majority of epidemiologists and infectious disease experts are against doing this. So to really talk about this requires its own news brief, which means it takes too much time here to really explore the ins and outs of it from a science-based perspective. And since the current administration has come out in favor of it, it's now been politicized, which makes it an even more critical issue to discuss and more important to discuss in depth because I think it's important to determine your support or opposition to this idea based on objective science. I really wanna have an opportunity to go through this material in as objective of a way as possible, talk about the pros, the cons, what the science says, what the science doesn't say, and, um, and uh, talk about potentially a little bit about the politics. But again, I wanna to try to keep this as politics free as possible, but I think that we can't ignore that at this point in time. Um, and so as a result of that, next Monday, I've set up a Zoom meeting just for this. Uh, the meeting has the same meeting ID and passcode as our monthly meetings. And if you're registered for these meetings, the pandemic check-in, you're automatically registered for it. I realize it's short notice, but don't worry. As with all the news briefs, I'll record it and share it online and uh, so that that way you'll have access to it. So, so that's it. And the PDF is in the chat, and I'll also post it online with the uh, video. And uh, thank you very much for listening.